the financial advisors who are best at marketing and lead generation around the world, and quite a lot of what they've got in common is good old fashioned. But there's one or two websites that really stand out head and shoulders above us. And those are the ones that have got video testimonials right there on the homepage, up front and central. Number two, start thinking in a way, okay, what can we do to engage the people who visit our websites? Uh, an absolute simple but brilliant way of doing it is to put some sort of Phil Calvert is a keynote speaker, author, and founder of Life Talk, the original online community for IFAs. This guy turned out to be the most successful financial advisor I've ever met, and he had a particular approach to lead gen, which is you can do it today, it's so, it's so easy. Financial advisors owe it to themselves to start learning how they can use this stuff within their businesses. Thanks so much for listening. This episode genuinely blew my mind. I hope you took as much value away from it as I did. And if you did, please share it with someone who you think might enjoy it as well. Um, thanks again. Bill, welcome. Great to have you on. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. So I was really keen to pick your brains on I guess your observations of transformative change around sales marketing um, over the last kind of 10, 20 years. Because I think there's a lot of hype at the moment that the pace of change has really picked up with digital technologies, with AI, with expectations around social media. And part of me wonders if that's, if that's true and things are really running at an entirely new pace or if actually um, change has always been there and it was a constant. Change has always been there. Um, and interesting you mentioned AI. I mean, that's thrown a right spanner in the works. Uh, when, when it comes to how financial advisors use it and everybody's got different attitudes towards AI, perhaps we'll come on to that. But I think when it, when it comes to attracting new clients, which we've, I've, I've got like an online community for financial advisors called Life Talk, uh, and it sits for the most part on Facebook. And uh, it's been on Facebook for the last 17 years. And advisors use it to network, share best practice, exchange ideas, ask questions, have a moan about providers, that sort of thing. But there's one question which comes up top of the list week after week after weekend. It's a per per permutation on the theme of how do other guys and girls attract new clients? Do people use this firm? Do people use that firm? Do people go to networking events? It's the same question, just described differently. Um, unfortunately, and, and the internet when the internet came along. There were one or two very early adopters who kind of got it straight away, and they realized, ah, oh, right, this is going to be a time saver. Uh, and I think that is the key, uh, is, is how you use it. And it's the same with AI. AI is really, you know, it can do all sorts of different things, but ultimately, right now, it's a productivity tool. And so when the internet came along, the, the people who embraced it straight away realized that this is, this is going to be a productivity. We can do the marketing and lead gen that we were doing already, but we can do it perhaps a bit more efficiently. However, there are still huge numbers of financial advisors who haven't still really grasped uh, how a website works, what its function is, uh, how LinkedIn works, and how they can actually use social media. And the question I get asked probably more than anything else when I'm working with advisors, is, hey, Phil, uh, our competitors down the road, Jones & Co, Financial Planning, they're using YouTube. Maybe we should give that a go. And so-and-so down the road, they're using uh, Facebook. Maybe we should give that a go. And so-and-so down the road, they're using Twitter, X. Maybe we should give that a go. And I have to say, well, yeah, maybe, if your target clients are on those channels. But otherwise, you know, tweet and hope is not a strategy. Um, you've really got to put your focus on where you believe your ideal clients hang out. For most financial advisors, they're on LinkedIn. Um, and yet whenever LinkedIn comes up in our Facebook group, there's a, we've got like a hardcore group of anti-LinkedIn advisors who say, oh, best thing I ever did on LinkedIn was to cancel my account because there are too many recruiters and, and people like that. And that straight away rings alarm bells and says, you don't really get how LinkedIn works. And I guess that's fair enough because at the end of the day, LinkedIn's a piece of software, like any other software that you might use in your business, CRM, your back office, whatever. Unless you've been trained on how to use it, you'll never see the real benefits. So that's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, there's been a lot of change, but we haven't quite embraced the change properly yet. And if anything, I think the, LinkedIn, the, the internet has made us quite lazy when it comes to lead generation. Because the you look at the best 
the financial advisors who are best at marketing and lead generation around the world, um, they've got several things in common. And quite a lot of what they've got in common is good old fashioned, old school approach to marketing and lead gen, things like seminars. And so these, these things that have kind of always worked and, and been the right approach, I suppose, is around um, educating your ideal clients, it's around um, putting out valuable content and, and, and helping. And then as a result, you generate interest or yeah. um, you know, bring the right people to the, to the table, I suppose. Yeah. Um, you know, here we are today. We are recording this the day after the budget. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the next few days, and particularly this coming weekend, journalists are going to be having a field day, putting various scenarios, case studies, and the weekend press is going to be packed full of personal finance related articles. That when you stop to think about it as a financial advisor, you begin to realize, well, actually, journalists are educating consumers. Journalists are educating our clients when arguably the financial advisors should be doing the education piece. So the advisors that were really on it yesterday afternoon, you know, an hour after the budget came out, would have been sending out some sort of communication to, to clients. Uh, at the very least, an email. Uh, at the best, a personalized video email. And one or two, I know of one, will have used an AI tool to use a hyper-realistic video avatar of themselves to do an update on it. So education is absolutely key. Um, education on personal finance issues, but also, and I think this is an area where as, a, and as an industry, as a profession, we've really failed, failed badly, is educating consumers on what financial planners, what financial advisors actually do and the value. Because I've had this theory for a long time that there are huge numbers of people out there who all heard about financial advisors and IFAs and financial planners and wealth managers, and that straight away were confusing people because we've got all these weird different titles, but they don't actually know what they do. And I, I think that financial advice, financial planning particularly, is one of those services that people actually need to experience it before they kind of get it as to what it is. So the education piece should be, yes, about matters relating to personal finance, but also education around what financial advisors actually do and how they do it. And that's why things like seminars work so well, is people can sit in the audience, um, they can cross their arms and be kind of nice, no, don't talk to me, you know. Um, they just want to hear what you have to say. And the financial advisors that do seminars and they do a kind of like case studies, live case studies are even better, then people sit in the audience, then they get it. They get, I get it. I understand now what you do. I understand now that perhaps working with a financial planner is more about my lifestyle in the future and achieving the things that, that I've not yet done. And maybe the money side of it just props it all up. So that's why education is so, so important for, for all sorts of different reasons. I, I'm interested as well in your thoughts on because um, education it, it, is hyper valuable around you know what sh people should be concerned about with their money and, and all those kind of aspects as well as like what the services and what a financial advisor can do. But it seems like through through social media and, and some of those like communication tools, like a, a video is potentially more impactful as a, as an update to written word because it gives your potential target market an opportunity to see you as a person and see what you're like and and think actually I quite like them. I could imagine them sitting in my house going through my finances being part of that that kind of yeah. reasonably intimate process. The human side, people by people, they always have done and always will do. We can have all the tech uh, that we like, but at the end of the day, it comes down to people and individuals. I interesting you should say that because some of the best financial advisor websites I've ever seen, the ones that really stand out. I mean, we, we've got to a point now where most financial advisors' websites look pretty good. There's some great... Uh, website designers uh, in the industry who help and support and put these together. But there's one or two websites that really stand out head and shoulders above us. And those are the ones that have got video testimonials of real clients right there on the homepage, up front and central. And this is where, where it really makes a difference because we can all put written testimonials, Ted and Mary, Gloucestershire, uh, and that could have been made up. Who knows? We'll assume that, that they are real testimony. But you simply cannot beat having an image of a couple or a single person sitting on their own sofa in their own home saying, do you know, when Mary Jones 
of Mary Jones Financial Planning came to meet us, the weight of the world came off our shoulders. She she came and she was like a family member. We felt we could talk to her about anything and all. It's that human stuff that really just jumps off a page. Um, and you know, if I'm gonna say just one thing, get video testimonials of real clients on your website so that real other people who are like them can see them and go, okay, if, if it's good enough for them and they look, kind of look like me and they sound like my situation, uh, that just dramatic makes such a difference. And are there any other, because um, I, th- I think that's really interesting, actually, <laughs> and like, like really high value, like impactful thing, and not necessarily a straightforward thing to execute on, but the, the impact of doing so f- feels huge. Would there be other um, really actionable strategies that you would say, I, you know, top performing financial advisors are doing these kind of things and it, it's kind of understandable, comprehensible and, and, and a kind of key takeaway. So it, it's, it's interesting. So when I've looked at, so I've spoken to over a million financial advisors around the world at conferences and events. And one of the things I've done over the years is really kind of look hard at, at what the, those advisors that are really smashing it when it comes to marketing and lead gen, they've got certain things in common. First of all, education. Now, and that education tends to be done through live marketing, seminars, uh, networking events, client events, those kind of things are networking uh, in, in real life. So any opportunity to get yourself and the whites of your eyes in front of other people to communicate your value and your proposition, that works extremely well. So that that's number one. Now, I mentioned we've got some really nice looking websites these days. Um, unfortunately, they all say the same thing. That isn't particularly helpful. It's, it's you know, if, in the old days, everything was done through referrals. You're at a dinner party uh, and someone said, hey, can anybody recommend a, you know, somebody can help my daughter get their, get their mortgage? Someone around the table would say, oh, yeah, take, check out Fred Smith. He's great. He's done, our, done ours for, for years and years. And, that's, and you wrote Fred Smith down on the napkin and the next day you phoned him up doesn't happen like that anymore. That conversation still takes place, but we write down Fred Smith on the napkin, but the next day we don't phone them up. What we tend to do is go to Google, Facebook, maybe we, your, you know, your online directory of choice. Um, and you, cause you want to feel involved in the process. You want to check them out. You want to do what that human thing. Do I like the look of them? Uh, can I see other people like me on their website who are saying how great they are? And what's interesting is, given that there is so much choice now, is that we may go and look up that particular mortgage broker or or IFA or whoever it is, but we're going to get distracted inevitably. We're going to look at, we're going to see somebody else in the same town. We're going to find somebody else in the same town. And it may well be that as a human, we prefer the look. Isn't it? You know, we do all these exams. Yeah, yeah. And it still comes down to human stuff at the end of the day. We've got all these websites. They all look the same. They all say the same. Uh, They all look very professional but they're not really helping us to differentiate ourselves. So number one, get some video testimonials on there. Number two, start thinking in a way, okay, what can we do to engage the people who visit our, visit our websites? And uh, an absolute simple but brilliant way of doing it is to put some sort of quiz on there. Give people uh, a low-risk thing to do, micro-commitment. You know, it's it's even been said that if you put on your website a little thing that says, hey, where did you hear about us? With a little drop down, Google, friend, Facebook, whatever. Even having something like that significantly increases the amount of engagement in your website because it's low risk. It's easy to do. It's something to do. So let's take it a stage further. Why don't you have a quiz or a scorecard, as it's often known, or a, a personal assessment, something people can do. And people just love personal assessments. We've all done them. Uh, all sorts of different, you know, could I be a marathon runner? Take the quiz, get your results the next 10 minutes. Am I, is my business ready to pitch to the dragons? Take the quiz. Uh, could I be a better lover? Take the quiz, you know, and we, we all love those, those sort of things. And we love them because they're personalized and we get instant results. So financial advisors could do this as well. You could have a quiz along the lines of, I don't know, um, how ready are you for retirement and the next phase of your life? Take the quiz. Uh, get your readiness for a retirement score. Take the quiz. And you've got 10 to 30 questions, something like that. Yes, no answers, a couple of multiple choices. The person taking the quiz gets their results instantly and a personalized report. The advisor 
gets all their contact details, and gets every answer to every question. So uh, the advisor can then just go through the answers and say, yeah, I like the look of this, this client, I like the look of this one, maybe not this one. Just taking your website from being a brochure to something that actually adds value and does something and helps uh, is completely different. You know, back in the day, and they still do this in the United States, and I'm s- still amazed that we don't see this much in the UK. What you do is you'd have your your website and you'd have a little box that says, hey, download our tips sheet for yeah. retirees. 10 tips for people retiring in the next year. Give us your email address, download the e-guide. It's a fair exchange of value. You put your email address in, you download your guide, the advisor's got your email address and they'll do whatever they'll do with it. Um, yet we still don't even do that very much at all, which is just, I find that bizarre. It's called a lead magnet. And I think that's half the problem. We, we feel the word lead magnet in our profession is a bit salesy. Uh, so maybe we can call it something else, a value piece or, or something. I don't know. But a quiz or a scorecard or a self-assessment tool of some description just takes that to a whole different level. And as well as sitting on your website, you can use it as part of seminars, as part of webinars. Um, when I speak at conferences, I talk to other speaker friends. We always talk about you know, how do we get the names and addresses of everybody in the audience? Uh, in the old days, we used to come up with bizarre ways of getting everyone's business cards. But if you're talking to 100 people or 1,000 people or 5,000, you're only going to end up with 50 or so. So we're trying to find new ways of getting names and contact details. And genius, along comes the scorecard idea, and you do a quick quiz during your presentation. Maybe a, a QR code up on the screen that takes someone straight to the quiz. They answer a few questions. They get an instant personalized report and maybe a freebie. And the person doing the presentation gets all the email addresses of everybody in the room and all the answers to all of the questions, which means you can then personalize how you follow it up. When I was a young broker rep in about 1987, something like that, um, part of my patch for a life office that I worked for was uh, Weybridge um, in Surrey. And there was one particular financial advisor. It was just him and his wife. And yet the amount of business that this guy was pushing our way was unbelievable. Huge amounts of business. And I remember saying to him one particular day, you know, how are you doing this? And he says, well, I'll, I'll tell you. And, and he, this guy turned out to be the most successful financial advisor I've ever met in over, well over 40 years. And he had a particular approach to lead gen, which is, you can do it today. It's so, it's so easy. I mean, this guy was so successful. His next door neighbor uh, was Cliff Richard. A couple of doors up, Tom Jones. So this guy's yeah, he's doing, yeah, well. He's doing well. <laughs> he's living in a certain part of Weybridge, which where a lot of A-listers still. Anyway, so I said to him, how, how do you do this? And he says, well, it's very simple. Um, I'm in Southwest London, essentially, and I like to uh, do the financial advice for uh, local business owners. Most of them are smallish business owners with you know, two or three employees and up at the top end, I've got about 500 employees. And they, he said that people who run printing firms and a bit of manufacturing and you know, all, all sorts. And he said, so I just do their pensions and their investments. And because they weren't called IFAs back then, um, financial planning wasn't even a concept. So he said, I just do them all. And I'd even do their, their car insurance and st- stuff like that. He says, but we got on well, you know, and he said, I wasn't doing anything particularly, anything particularly fancy. And he said, they all networked with each other. So I got referrals from them. And he said, but what I always did with every single business owner that, that I worked with was I always said to them, would it be possible if I could do a presentation to your staff at a tea break, lunch break? you know, 20 minutes in their, in their lunch break. We'll just talk about personal finances, just things they need to think about. And they would always say yes. Um, so he, he told me that, you know, depending on how many appointments he had that, that week, some days he'd be, he'd see, you know, five, five people. Some days he'd do, a pre- he'd be, he'd, by the end of the day, he'd had seen two or 300 people. He said, but the trick was I had a hand, was he had a handout. And the handout was basically like a big, uh, postcard with five questions on it and a space that asks for their name and address. And the five questions were usually things like, uh, would you say you're a regular saver? Um, how would your family be impacted if you were hit by a bus tonight? Real basic, five basic questions and their name and address. And he'd say, if, if at the beginning of the presentation, he said, if you could fill out the postcard, put your name and address on it, 
uh, before I go, I'll pick one at random. Someone will get a bottle of wine and he'd do his presentation. He'd collect up all the postcards. He'd then go home. And then between himself and his wife, they would then send a personalized letter, no email back then, a personalized letter to every single person who filled in a postcard. And the letters would go something along the lines of, hey, Mrs. Jones or Mr. Jones, I hope you enjoyed the presentation today. Uh, thanks for filling out the postcard. I noticed from your answers that you're on top of your savings. That's really good. Keep it going. That will serve you well in the future. But I also noticed that if you were hit by a bus tonight, uh, your family's got a problem. Would you like some help with that? He told me his take-up rate was about 95% on hundreds and hundreds of these things coming through. So he got a pretty slick system of how the letters went out and all those things. But everyone was personalized. Everyone he hand wrote their name. Uh, so it was a personalized experience. Um, and to me, that's just genius. Now, fast forward to today, what is a scorecard or an assessment? It's the same thing. You ask people a bunch of questions. They get value from the result. You get a lot of data that you can use as you see fit. And to, so to me, that approach, plug one of those into your website uh, and it would literally transform it. And what I've tended to find is IFAs that, that plug these into the websites, they kind of come back a few months later and they say, Phil, could we do one for another? We've got a lot of dentists as clients. Could we do one that's just focused on dentists or just focused on uh, something, somebody else? So personalization is, is was important then and it's really important now. What really struck me in that was, um, you know, if you go back to handwritten notes, you ask a question, what would happen to your family in the event of your death? You're going to write something fairly random if you're a person that's not taken the CII exams and knows what yeah. protection policies might be, might be appropriate for that. And, and one, of the, one of the challenges probably through the 2010s with, with digitization of some of these um, kind of scorecards, I suppose, is you have to ask a fairly tight question yep. to people and they have to kind of understand the answer you're expecting. Um, I wonder, or it seems to me that um, AI kind of opens that back up again, where people can type their answer as it kind of comes to them. You can have some um, digitized passing of that that can kind of understand when people say, I'm not quite sure what I mean. Actually, now we can generate at scale on mass yeah. personalized replies. So the, the trick, with and there's, there's several different uh, scorecard software tools that you can use. And they all do much, much the same. But the trick when you're creating the questions is they've got to really be quick and easy to get through. You don't want people to have to think too hard. You don't want people to have to go and look stuff up. Uh, it's simple. Yes, no. Yes, no. Maybe a couple of multiple choices, maybe some sliding scales in there as well. So the longer your questions, the more likely it is that they, they, they might stop halfway through. So we've got to get them through this thing get their report, um, and so they get their value. And this is, the, this is the psychology bit. Human beings love to bench them up themselves against other human beings. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, my business is my business ready to pitch the dragons? Well, my friend next door who's got a new business, looks like he is, I don't know. People love to benchmark themselves against some sort of standard that an expert has set. As I said, we've done them all the time, all these quick quizzes. And, you know, sometimes we put a fake email address in because you feel you're going to get spammed. But a lot of these quiz software tools, they know that people put fake email addresses in and they have a way of encouraging people to put the correct email address in. Uh, I, I, you know, you don't get your freebie or you don't get your report at the end if you put fake email addresses. Um, so, yeah, the questions are really important. But different some financial advisors think, okay, maybe we could use this in another way. Maybe uh, let's let's take the annual review for example. Some advisors now are using a scorecard as part of the annual review because a lot of them say well, the annual review is a bit tedious. We can we can make it a bit more exciting, and they'll so they'll put every existing client through a more advanced scorecard every single year, so they can then see how their answers change over time. I so say it might be that there's been a year where the stock market's gone through the floor. And that might cause concern and worry. So you'll see this, the answers to the same questions will be different. And that creates opportunity for discussion. It also creates opportunity for referrals uh, as well, because it, it's seen as a valuable tool that the advisor is using. And if the, uh, I mean, this is one of the keys to getting more referrals is recognizing that, that you are giving value. And if you're giving value, that makes it much more likely that people will, will refer you. 
So we were chatting earlier a little bit about um, AI, and I know you've you've written and spoken a lot and, and really dug into AI. It'd be super interesting to get your take on the best or the best applications of that technology to uh, marketing and lead generation, or even just your your thoughts and observations so far. Yeah, well, so assuming we've got two or three hours, uh, we can talk, we can talk about AI forever. But what's I, over the years, I've been moderately obsessed with how advisors use technology, particularly in a marketing situation. And if we go back to the the early days of advisors who had websites, those early adopters, it was really interesting what they actually did. Um, and the thinking back in the day was that you had to make your website sticky. That's what that's kind of what they called it. So somebody had found your website, however that was, and then you had to do everything you possibly could to hold them there. And the way of doing that back then was there were all sorts of plugins that you could plug into your website. So you could plug in a weather tool, a widget, a widget of some sort. You could have the stock market ticker on your on your. You could have the racing results of new market on your website. And it, so they made they made websites look absolutely terrible. But the early adopters said actually they worked. Uh, consumers who found the website they really liked it um, because it was new and it was a new way for advisors to get across their proposition. Fast forward to today, we have AI, we have ChatGPT, and it's really interesting to, to me. Um, AI is this really is a big moment in the world of financial advice and planning. It is not an understatement to say um, this is a industrial revolution moment. We have a big problem, though, is that a very large proportion of financial advisors still see AI as something that's coming down the track in a couple of years' time. Um, and even then, they're saying, well, we, we couldn't possibly use AI because of data issues, and that's absolutely fine. Um, yet, we do have early adopters who are using AI to write suitability letters, create their websites, do all kinds of different stuff. The really clever thing about AI, though, is the ability to, to personalize it to you and your clients. So, for example, if we were putting together our own website, yes, there are AI tools that will create your website. Add in, you know, put in a few keywords, there's your website done in 30 seconds flat, and it'd be fairly passable. But the really clever part is that you can, the words that, that you use on a website is where you tell the AI to act as if they were a certain person. So maybe you're a financial planner and you specialize in later life lending. So you have a very particular type of client in mind. So you tell the AI to act as if um, they are that particular type of person. And then you ask it to write the copy aimed at them. And that's the, that's the really clever part. And it's just getting better and better at, better at doing this. Uh, and again, I, I quite often say this, we are only limited by our own imaginations as to how we're going to use AI. It is going to utterly transform the profession. There is absolutely no question about that. Um, there are a number of financial... I did a presentation only yesterday, just to a small group, 10 financial advisors in a room. Two of them sat through the presentation with their arm very firmly crossed like this. And I, I, I get that. Um, I don't want to come across as one of those people that says, look, shiny new thing, we've got to use it. Because, you know, play around with it and have fun with it. But financial advisors owe it to themselves to start learning how they can use this stuff within their businesses. My focus on marketing, but it's going to be able to use it in a whole bunch of different ways. And yes, we will come to the point where AI can do the job of a financial planner. There is no question of that. And I know a lot of people are more than happy to argue that point with me, given that I've already said people by people. But what I'm really getting at is here is an opportunity for financial planners to look at AI and look at it as a new member of staff an opportunity to create new income streams where there weren't before, um, and a whole bunch of it, to, to do all that marketing stuff that you know you should be doing that aren't doing. And I, you know, I do whole day marketing workshops. Um, we, we cover off all the old school stuff, all the exciting new stuff. But I know the back of my mind that, that most advisors will go back. They might pick out one thing. They might give it a go. But the vast majority of it, they'll go, that was nice, Phil. Um, but I know it won't get done because they haven't got the time and they haven't got the resource, maybe the manpower to, to get it done. Along comes AI. We can get all this stuff. We can get blogs written. Uh, we can get press releases written. We can get. We can do the simple stuff and just get it done in a second. 
and uh, but it's really important to remember a lot of the stuff that AI spits out is garbage. Some of it's made up. So if we were to take it as read, right, let's write a blog on on inheritance tax planning or whatever, and just bung it out there, you could have all kinds of problems. Think of it as AI bakes the cake, then you, the chef, finesses it, puts the icing on, finishes it off, checks it, makes sure it's it's fit for purpose. So very exciting times. Um, and if you think about it, a lot of financial planners, they 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 say they would like to offer services to a broader group of people, but they can't because it's not profitable to do so. And there's huge numbers of people out there um, who know they need the services of a financial planner once they learn what a financial planner does, um, but they won't be able to afford the fees. But AI will help us to be able to do that. So let's take one example. If you go to a website like Udemy, um, which is like what YouTube for courses. There are people, particularly in the United States, they've done this a lot, will have created a course on financial planning, on personal finance, uh, and they charge $17 for it, $20, whatever, whatever for it. And some of these have had tens of thousands of reviews. Now, any financial advisor in the UK can take the expertise and the experience they've got up here and they can repackage it and turn it into something else, like a course. Uh, and AI can do that for you. I mean, you can do it yourself. It takes you a little, little while to do, but you can go to ChatGPT and say, I want to create a course on just general personal finance for people who have just maybe reached management level in, in their in their organization. Um, and you get it to, so you can say to ChatGPT, you know, what, what should this course cover? It'll do that. Um, then you can get it to do a bit more detail. You can get it to do, and there's even AI tools now that will create the videos for you based on that as well. So um, the opportunity for advisors now to broaden their proposition, maybe even create a whole new proposition with different branding, different website that's aimed at another market. That we can do now, and you can do it in an afternoon, which is just just incredible. Yeah, it, it, it's so exciting. And it makes me think of um, Kajabi, the course creation, they, they've launched their own AI course creator. Yeah. So you literally do Great all that job. in a platform and monetize it and launch it. Um, yeah. Yeah. In an afternoon. And it'd probably even ask ChatGPT, how do I make my lighting good? How can I improve at a low cost uh, the, the sound yeah. quality on, on this? And the, the yeah. thing, there's one thing that, that I just love uh, is a tool called HeyGen, and there will be plenty of others. And one of the features of HeyGen, so maybe you want a course, you upload your scripts to it and you pick an avatar. It will create a video of, of, of your course using a particular avatar. But HeyGen goes a stage further where you can have a hyper realistic video avatar of yourself presenting the course. So, not every IFA will be comfortable creating the course themselves, but they would perhaps like to front it. So, you can go to it and you literally just take a couple of photos of yourself, upload it to HeyGen, and HeyGen will turn that into a living, breathing, moving version of you presenting your course on camera. Now, this then makes me think, ah, so there's all sorts of things you could do with that. So maybe you do on your website, maybe you do have an option for people to register for your newsletter. So instead of just sending them the next newsletter, you could have a hyper-realistic video avatar of yourself saying, thanks, Mrs. Jones, for registering for our newsletter. I uh, hope you're going to find you're going to get the first edition day after tomorrow. Now, to me, that's you're now using AI for customer service. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you can use AI and hyper realistic video avatars for all a whole range of different. So maybe someone registers for your workshop or your seminar or your webinar. Every time someone registers, auto email with you speaking to them using their name. Um, that's that's fabulous customer service. So I know AI is scary for a lot of people, but the reason why we need to learn about what it can do, what it can't do, what its capabilities are, is that there's so much opportunity as a, as a result of using it. So much. And keep, yeah, for now, keep client data well away from it. But in the meantime, look at it as a tool to help you get all sorts of stuff done that you're not doing that you know you should be doing. That that kind of uh, <clears throat> friction for people to jump in and use an AI tool. I, you know, I've seen it in, 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 in my team, in my family, in my friendship group. And I often say, what we're going to do is sit you down in front of ChatGPT and you're going to dedicate an hour just to playing around with it. And here's some, some prompts and some things to ask. And once, once they do that, once they get over the friction of actually logging in 
and asking a couple of questions, you can see the light bulbs clicking and yeah, yeah. Um, the opportunities just, just, just start scaling. So I wondered, w- would that be a thing you'd advocate for for financial advisors? Yeah. Just jump in and what would be the, the kind of two or three things you think they should start with? Is it blog posts? Is it, um, yeah. Re- re- really, really interesting. So blatant plug, my next book is about prompts for financial advisors, just to, to play around with it. But let's playing around it is one thing. Um, using it and playing around with it, let's do it in a safe way that that really works. So one thing I've always advocated with with financial advisors is PR. Um, and somebody, a BBC journalist, told me long, long time ago. They said everything you ever do in your business, tell the press. Um, and I thought this is really, really interesting. And I I can apply that to financial advisors as well. So you know, if you're sponsoring the local kids' football team tell the press, send out a press release. If you've gone, your colleagues have gone on a customer service course, tell the press. You've got a new back office system, tell the press. You painted the outside of your office, tell the press. Uh, build relationships with the press. Now, what this person told me was that 95% of what you send to the press will not end up in the press. What you are actually doing is building relationships with the press. So when something happens at a national level, or at an important local level, who's the press going to turn to for expert comment? Financial advisors, where they've got a relationship. And today, literally today, the day after the budget, that's what will be happening. Journalists with relationships uh, with particular financial advisors around the UK will be going to them asking for their comments on it. Um, so you could use ChatGPT to write your press releases, because a lot of people go, what's a press release? You know, it's a kind of dark art for us, as far as... A lot of people are concerned. Just go to ChatGPT uh, and say, uh, as a financial planning business, we have just agreed a sponsorship deal with a local under-11 girls football team. Put in a bit more detail and ask it to write the press release. It will spit it out in all of a second. Um, and there's a great way to, to start using it in a way. And obviously, you're going to check it over and check the tone and style is, is your sort of thing. But even then, you can train it to to be in your style. So yeah, play around with it, you know, have fun with it. If you've got chat GPT plus and you've got the mobile app, go to your fridge, take a photo of the inside of your fridge and ask it what, what you should cook for dinner. And it will do it just in, in a second. I've been playing around with AI art. Yes, uh, I've got yeah. a separate Instagram channel of art that I've created. I know nothing about art, but I enjoy creating the prompts that will create the output. And you know, we always heard this about technology, garbage in garbage out. And I think that's the that's the bit that financial advisors need to just play around with different prompts um, and see. I, I remember a, a financial advisor last year, within uh, 30 minutes of the chancellor sitting down after the budget, he had done a summary of the budget written in po- uh, uh, as a poem, yeah. which he sent out to all his clients. Uh, why? I have no idea. <laughs> but he thought it was going. But he's got that kind of relationship with clients. But you can do this stuff. That you know you ought to be doing, and you could, so that's that's where it really comes into play. So I, I've, this has been so fascinating. I've been really really enjoying the, the chat. I know we've we've spent a lot of time on digital marketing, social media, AI. I wonder about you know some of the more old school stuff, and that this got to still have input, impact and, and relevance. Yeah, old school stuff. Number one, seminars and events. They just work. And I know I, I can convince any advisor they need to be put on seminars and workshops. But I know in the back of their mind they're thinking. Uh, you know, um, how do we get bums on seats? That's basically, uh, what, am I going to be taking a risk hiring a nice venue and nobody turns up? It's just a process. Follow the process um, and you'll get the bums on seats. And don't start too big. Start small. Put on a local seminar just for a target five people, 10 people. But here's the thing. Financial advisors that have used seminars over the years, all around the world, uh, particularly United States, uh, Australia, and a few in the UK, they realize that they when, when they put on seminars, that's when the magic really starts. And they are usually shocked to discover how high the conversion rates are. I know one particular financial advisor down in the Southwest, he committed himself to putting on local seminars, and he would just do a kind of generic personal finance talk, an education piece, and a nice local hotel, and he targeted getting 50 people in a room and bit of trial and error as to what the presentation was. He said, after he'd done this about three times, 
uh, he he got a certain conversion rate. In fact, let me ask let me ask you sort of the question to you. So he's got fifty people in a room. If a conversion is someone turns up and then subsequently says, "How can we work together?" Either on the day or a week later, what sort of percentage conversion rate do you think would be good? What would you be pleased with? Even if you know three, four, five people, you know five, ten percent, I'd, I'd be pretty happy. Okay. Well, the stat show: if you aren't getting twenty five percent. It means you've either turned up drunk or <laughs> you've got the wrong answers, wrong audience in the room. This particular guy down in the Southwest, he said to me, well, Phil, he said it was pretty good. And I said, Tom, it was pretty good. And he said, 90, 95%. This is not uncommon. I know advisors across all kinds of disciplines in financial advice see these really high conversion rates. And then they start to, then they get it. They suddenly realize, okay. What this actually means is I can pick and choose the people I actually want to work with. Yeah. People come up and they say, they say, I really enjoyed the program. How do we work together? Uh, you can, you can say, well, you know, maybe I don't want to work. Maybe you can work with my colleague here. Um, it's a kind of blunt way of putting it, but yeah, yeah. you can pick and choose. It just works. So seminars just work. One to many works. Uh, other things that really work quite well, I know a financial planner in Guildford who combines two things. He sponsors roundabouts. Oh, that's properly old school, isn't it? Sponsoring <laughs> yeah. a local roundabout. Yeah. And he picks and chooses his roundabouts really carefully. And all they are, we've, we've driven past roundabouts. They've got a little plaque on them saying, um, sponsored by so-and-so. And he said, but what he also does is he tries to appear on local radio as well. Yeah. Once a month. Uh, they'll do a phone in in the afternoon. Um, and he said, every single new client that comes his way, when they walk in through his door, they say either, oh, I saw your roundabout this morning, or I heard you on the radio last week. Yeah. Um, so that kind of old school stuff, it just still works. Um, I know another financial advisor down in Cornwall who I said to him, who's your ideal dream client? And he described them. I said, well, where do they hang out? Presumably that's where you do your marketing. And expecting him to say no, but he said, no, I'm on, I know I'm on to this one, Phil. He said, my ideal dream client are all members of the local Crown Green Bowling Club. Yeah. He said, so I've got a big advertising board nailed to the fence going round the crowd. He said, it cost me £350 for five years advertising. Wow. Uh, that's old school. Yeah. Uh, and because he's a sponsor, he's also in the club magazine. Uh, they also said to him, look, for another £100, would you like to sponsor a competition? Uh, so he's got his own cup. And he said, yeah, I'll do that because the press is always there to take photos of people collecting their prizes. So that that's properly old fashioned stuff. And I'm seeing one I'm also starting to see one or two advisors now doing going back to paper newsletters. Yes. Yeah. Super easy to do these days. Um with digital printing, go to a website like Canva, use a template, put in your content, have it printed, done. Yeah. Works really well. And I saw another one only a couple of days ago who's got his own magazine, which he Reduces it. It's an annual thing, but it's glossy. It's really nice. Um, so we don't have to have shiny stuff all of the time. The old stuff still works as well. But the key really is about knowing who your ideal client is and then putting your focus on there. We don't have to use all. This is the problem. We've got too distracted by all the shiny stuff. Yeah, yeah. And we think, oh, if I don't use YouTube, I'm going to miss out. If I don't use Twitter or X, I'm going to miss out. If I don't use Instagram, perhaps I'm going to miss out. And that's just just nonsense. Go where they hang out. You know. And if, for example, if your target market is dentists nearing retirement, they all read the same magazines. They all go to the same trade shows. So that's where you go as well. That's amazing. I, so Phil, thanks so much. I, I feel like um, my head is buzzing and exploding <laughs> with, with cool stuff. They really appreciate it conversation thanks for thanks for coming on pleasure nice to see you